Hello, everyone. Ooh, I can hear myself. Um, thank you for that introduction and to all of you for coming um, and to the 92nd Y uh, for including us in your wonderful programming. We are honored to be here. Um, I have been calling you dad <laughs> for 14 years. Yeah. And in this memoir, you never know, I got to know Tom Selleck on a much deeper level in all the different stages and phases of your journey. This is filled with stories and insights and invaluable lessons, life lessons. And um, if there's any actors out here in the audience tonight, really beautiful gems for actors. So if there are any, get your highlighters out and get ready because you're gonna learn a lot from this man. Um, so again, thank you for sharing all of this with us. Thanks. Um, I, uh, I think my irreplaceable partner is somewhere out there, Ellis Hennigan. Is Ellis here? He's up there, and I don't know, but please, Ellis is shy, but I'm, go ahead and stand up and wave at everybody. I can't see anyone. Oh, so. hi, Ellis. <laughs> All right, now I'm seeing too many people. Put it back down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's just do this. Um, yeah. You, in your memoir, you jump in pretty quickly to your time at USC. Yeah. And I really do feel like this is like that sliding doors moment of your life, this launching off point. And one of the things we know about Tom at work, all of us, the directors, the writers, everyone, Tom is all about the work. He is, he respects the work, he's disciplined about the work. So it was very surprising to me <laughs> to learn that you weren't always that way. I wasn't always that way. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, college wasn't about the work, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> look, I, I never lived away from home, and <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the Sigma Chi house was just too much fun. Uh, <laughs> so um, I was kind of constantly on academic probation, and yeah. um, um, Riding the pine on the basketball team, and uh, I wasn't very motivated. I didn't. I hadn't really thought anything through. I, I didn't. Certainly didn't want to be an actor. I never thought of that in my life. But I kind of was in the business school because my dad was in business. Yeah. And obviously, I respected my dad very much. So I was just plugging away, and uh, you never know comes from what really was a whole accidental career. Yeah, I, it really seems like you kind of just stumbled into acting. I, you, you had to, I, I have to read this quote because it's, it's <laughs> amazing. Your dean actually said, your transcript is the most remarkable record of mediocrity that I've ever <laughs> seen. Yeah, well, I kind of knew Dean Hemstreet. Uh, his <laughs> daughter was in a sorority. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I that wasn't was, in the book, people. I thought he was actually finding something good in my transcripts till <laughs> he gave me the punchline. Well, so to get out of this academic probation, you had to get your grades back up, and you took a class, hist is it the history of? Well, I actually took it in junior college. Okay. Because my grades aren't very good there either. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> I wanted to go to SC. I had been in junior college playing basketball for two years and because my parents couldn't afford four years, they mm -hmm. were sending my brother Bob to SC. So it was time to, to uh, apply for SC. <laughs> they kind of said, go back for another semester and improve your grades. So I, and yeah, I, yeah. I, uh, I heard there was a theater, history of the American theater class, not an acting class. There was an easy A. It was an easy A. <laughs> and it was. But in this easy A. But I, it wasn't about acting, but the yeah. teacher did say, you'd be a good type for commercials. And I said, 
I, I don't know anything about him, but I hear you can make some money. Okay, and he, he introduced me to an agent. Yeah, and yeah. you ended up um, Pepsi commercial, and you, while you're at USC, also did the dating game. Yeah, and of course the rest is history. Um, <laughs> about 14 years later. The best is that he wasn't even picked. Like, what if you're that I woman wasn't picked twice. now knowing, I didn't pick Tom Selleck? I, I wasn't funny. I was really scared. Yeah. I remember, you know, they have like a revolve and you're behind this little revolve and you, you know who the, the, the uh, your date is, and I was bachelor number two, and the guy said, I was scared to death, and he, and he said, uh, uh, be sure when the revolve comes around and you see the audience and the lights come up, be sure to smile. <laughs> and I did, and the revolve came around, and <laughs> I remembered to smile, except I was so nervous, my heart was causing my... <laughs> No wonder she didn't pick you. Matching my pulse, and uh, I did, it's not like I had a mustache to cover it up. Well, <laughs> I'm sure it's out there. Um, all right, so, and all of this kind of led to a unique opportunity, which doesn't actually exist anymore. It was, um, the studios at the time had a, a talent training program. Yeah, so you were a asked new to talent go. program. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, through this agent, he, uh, uh, casting director saw me on <laughs> the dating game, losing, <laughs> and probably saw the magic shining through. <laughs> and uh, um, so I end up going to, to Fox yeah. um, to meet them, and uh, I had to audition. So I'd never done a scene in my life. He said, you have to do a scene. I said, what's that? Yeah. I said, a scene from a play. And so <laughs> I, I worked with, I, I was uh, on weekends when SC was uh, having a game on Friday and Saturday. Thursday night, they, we were what they call locked up in the hotel so they could keep control of us. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to play. Um, so it wasn't my finest hour. But I snuck out of the hotel to rehearse with this, uh, my agent's friend and an actress and, and auditioned, and it was, it was really horrible. Um, <laughs> well, you must have done something right. I didn't do anything right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what happened is I had a clever agent, and he, uh, this was at Fox, he, he told the people at Fox that Universal, which also had a program, wanted me. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told the people at Universal that Fox wanted me. And Universal wasn't in the slightest bit interested. So, th and he said, so you gotta let Tom know today. And they, they took me to, uh, um, they said, well you, well, you gotta meet our boss because we have to tell you today. Yeah. And I thought it was, you know, their, their, their boss. It was the boss, it was the head of 20th Century Fox Studio, <laughs> Richard Zanuck. And well, I, I go in, you know, and, and they sit down and say, he's really green, but that's what the new talent program's for, so. And he's staring at my resume. <laughs> he's just looking at this thing transfixed. <laughs> and my resume consisted of an Air Force training film and a Pepsi-Cola commercial. And the dating game. So, and I didn't put that on my resume. Oh. <laughs> um, so they basically, um, I didn't know what he was so fascinated about till he said, you play at USC. And I said, yes, I do. You play basketball. He said, well, I'm a huge UCLA fan. So uh -oh. that's the rivalry in LA. And I gave him a little crap like any good Trojan, and, um, <laughs> um, and I told him that um, actually I, I, I'm sitting on the bench most of the time, so when you prepared for UCLA, which was, they were national champs that year, they were really good, and uh, when you prepared for them, um, the guys who weren't going to play very much learned the UCLA offense, offense and ran it 
against the first string. And UCLA had a guy by the name of Lou Alcindor, <laughs> Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. <laughs> so I tell Dick, Dick Zanuck, I said, I'm the, I'm the tallest guy of the group who isn't going to play. So when we prepare for UCLA, I am Lou Alcindor. <laughs> And that was my, my meeting. He said, hey, let's do this thing. I mean, it had nothing to do with acting or anything else. But uh, Basketball and golf gets you into every door. Pure serendipity. Yeah. Okay. A smart agent. Yeah, very smart. But I, I think th th it really sounds like this program was influential in, in, in helping you develop habits that you've used throughout your whole entire career. I mean, your yeah. acting coach, uh, Kurt Conway, yeah, right? Yeah, from the actor's studio. Mm -hmm. And you, you actually learned to be a good student there. Well, I had work habits. I had them in sports. Right. Uh, and I had them in acting from the beginning. I, I, I knew you had to practice. I knew you had to fail. Because, um, frankly, if you don't develop an appetite for failure as an actor or an athlete, mm -hmm. um, you're, you're never going to succeed. Because it's the great trainer, actually. Too many people are afraid of it. I hope they get that out of the book. Um, but uh, so, I, yeah, I had really good work habits in, at Fox. <laughs> yeah. Not at SC. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I don't know. I don't have any excuses. And I felt a little guilty because my parents had borrowed money to send me there. Oh, I think you made up for it, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, but I didn't know it at the time. Yeah. Um, one, of the, um, one of your, I guess, classmates or fellow actors in the program was um, Sam Elliott. Yeah. Sam was we in all the program. Love and adore. He arrived about a month after I got there. Well, you said, you said in the book that he, he came fully formed. Sam, Sam was just kind of ready. Um, I, on the other hand, was kind of a work in progress. <laughs> Sam kind of knew what he wanted. He already had some training, and uh, he was very impressive. Um, he wasn't quite as impressive as I was in ballet class. <laughs> Although he, he, his leaps were pretty good, but <laughs> I, I, as I put it in the book, I surpassed the magnificent leaps of even Sam Elliott. <laughs> if you can imagine the two of us in leotards. I have been ever since I read the book. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun. Uh, we were learning tap and soft shoe. They had voice classes, acting classes, dance classes. I was only making maybe about 90 bucks a week, but uh, that was okay. Yeah. And uh, after about two months of being scared to death, uh, I started liking it. Yeah. Which was great. Well, you're, you're, I feel like it was Kurt who said, um, at some point, you will need to start bringing the six foot four, good looking leading man into the room. So yeah. I'm wondering how that landed on you. And also, when did you catch up to that? When did you start feeling on the inside what was on that, the outside? That was a long work in progress. Yeah. I mean, to have actual confidence in that. Um, but I mean, I did, uh, I did a play Hatful of Rain, which is like a serious, serious drama. and. Uh, uh, and the rainmaker, and I would get up in front of the class in a chair, the two actors who did the scene, and Kurt would critique us. And uh, I, t <laughs> I told him once, I said, why, I, I, don't, I don't like the rainmaker. He says, why? You're perfect for it. I said, the guy's an asshole. <laughs> um, um, and he says, you're, it's not your job to like the guy. It's your job to play him. So I had more of an appetite for um, comedy mm -hmm. and making a fool of myself. And, and basically, he said, you know, sooner or later, 
you're going to have to find a way to deliver that guy who walks in the door. Yeah. But I, so my whole process was finding a way to do it and do it my way. That's a good lesson. I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It, it was, uh, it, uh, look, it was, it was great being at, at Fox. One, uh, one thing that happened uh, very quickly, mm -hmm. uh, one thing I neglected to concentrate on was I dropped some classes at SC and I no longer had a student deferment. I wasn't at SC anymore. Yeah. I don't know why college kids got a student deferment but a plumber didn't, but that's kind of another story. <laughs> but uh, anyway, basically I got my physical notice for the military and that means you're gonna um, be drafted in 30 days. Yeah. So I had a choice of the draft or to enlist or the reserves. And I had this great opportunity at Fox, so uh, yeah, I ended up in the uh, California Army National Guard. Yeah. For six years. And you earned a- Thank you. Yeah. And you ended up earning the rank of sergeant. Yeah, I was very proud of that. Yeah. Um, I, I did really good in the military. I, I uh, adapted. You could either hide or you could uh, excel. And I thought, well, I don't want to do KP. I don't want to do guard duty. Those are awful duties. I, if I excel and I'm in a leadership position, I don't have to do that stuff. So, but it taught me a lot. Um, I get, I was constantly selected in all the classes I had in my six months of active duty in, uh, in to be put in leadership positions. And you know, as actors, we learn a lot through our experiences. And yeah. that was the first thing that made me think, well, I guess I can do this. Well, you I'm know, there's, they saw something and uh, it's very hard to get the rank of sergeant in those days, so. Well, I, I'm sure that a lot of what you did there ended up being useful for some of your roles in, in the future, particularly. I, I think it did. Yeah. Um, you know, um, a lot of guys, <laughs> most of Hollywood wasn't in the military <laughs> at that time. <laughs> so, um, and you know, I could, if I was on a show with a group of actors and they were playing, um, soldiers, um, I could kind of straighten them out a little. Yeah. Because <laughs> they got this Hollywood idea of uh, what it was about, and, it, and uh, yeah. that isn't quite it. Well, you, you wrote, I was no hero, but I served. I pulled my weight, and I just love that. It's so full of pride and, and humility at the same time. The witch? I didn't hear that last part. You said, I was no hero, but I served. I pulled my weight. Well, yeah, I was no hero. I did serve, um, served for six years, um, and had some experiences, a couple that weren't um, that pleasant, but it gave me a lot of insight. It wasn't a very popular time to be in the military. Yeah. But I know when I did my six months active duty, there was a part of me that wanted to be just like my dad. And uh, I, I drove back from uh, Fort Ord um, in Northern California home and I wanted to wear my uniform and I got a lot of not so pleasant looks all the way back but yeah. uh, I wanted to come home in uniform. My dad had done the, a similar thing and um, look if I could if I could end up being just like my dad that that'd be great. It's so nice. Okay, so you come back. Yeah. <laughs> Box training, that has been phased out. They got rid of that. Um, yeah, they fired me. They fired all of us Yeah. at Fox. Yeah, yeah they canceled the program. The program. Um, but you got signed to a, a development deal at Universal. You, you're auditioning. You, you're being sought, you know, going out on auditions. You get the opportunity to be on a show that you always admired <laughs> and you 
always admired the lead actor. This is Rockford Files with James yeah. Garner. I, listen, I, uh, I just love James Garner. I loved his work. Um, so it was a big thrill. I, I actually almost met him once, um, <laughs> years before, at a little par three golf course. I, and I hit an errant shot, which was my customary golf shot. <laughs> and it flies up in the air to the tee next door and almost hits Jim Garner. <laughs> I never told him about that. <laughs> but yeah, to work with Garner was um, kind of a dream because I thought that's, that's the box I ought to put myself in. That's, that's where I could do both, as mm -hmm. he did. I can be the lead, I can do that stuff, but I can find the comedy and tragedy and the tragedy and comedy. And uh, no one uh, was better at that than yeah. Jim Garner. So, well, and he gave me the, the great piece of advice of my life. I think. Yes, which we will get to. Yeah, I was, uh, I got assigned this show called Magnum. <laughs> no, not what you think. It was horrible. And uh, uh, basically they had assigned a show called Magnum to me on a deal that has already uh, expired and it got all legal and everything else and I, I, I read the script and I, I, I just didn't like it. The guy who wrote it is a nice guy, Glenn Larson, and he did, but I didn't like any of his shows and I, I didn't like the, <laughs> the script and I got in and I had this legal issue and uh, so I'm sitting after my second Rockford, and Garner knew me pretty well. He drove me back in his van from a, a location, which is illegal, but he didn't care. So we're sitting there waiting for the crew to catch up, and he, and he was kind of, he kind of took me under his wing, and he says, what's going on? I said, what, you, nothing. And he said, come on. I said, well, the studio has assigned, signed, this show called Magnum, and I hate it. And they don't have a right to do it in the contract. And he said, well, I'm not going to give you advice. Jim was very humble. He said, but I'll tell you this. You don't have any power. <laughs> but if they want you, you will never have more power than you do right now. He said, so I'm not telling you what to do. <laughs> but, uh, and I said, no. Yeah, and, and that, that could not have been easy. Battle for a, a show called Magnum that Don Belisario wrote. That was like a year later, and uh, everything was in, in limbo. And, uh, but it was the best advice of my life, obviously, professional life, certainly. Yeah. Well, we can jump right into Magnum, or we can go to a space that I feel like we should go to, because it really informed everything on Magnum. It was a show that um, was called The Sackets. Yeah, well, I, I, The Sackets was before, it was just before Rockford, I think. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I went on, and, this audition and um, for this four-hour miniseries, it was a Western. I'd, I'd never done a Western. I mean, I pretended I was in a Western a couple times, but... <laughs> and uh, it was just... Uh, ben Johnson was on that movie, and he, he along with Jim Garner, it, uh, those are kind of my two mentors. And it... It was a difficult shoot because the director who I deeply respected, Bob Totten, um, and the crew just loved and respected. And every actor who came on the show doing that movie was like watching the Selleck television set um, as I was growing up. So basically, he came to me and he said, I didn't want you for this part. 
And he, he's just dead honest, Totten, and a great guy, and I wanted his respect. The reason it was such a breakthrough, other than it taught me about a lifestyle that I embraced and live to this day with, but more than that, over the course of that film, I, my work earned his respect. Mm -hmm. Till finally after a scene, <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, getting major praise from Totten was never gonna happen. <laughs> but um, I just did a scene and he just kind of went by me, just passed me and said, I think I can brag on you on that one. Um, and I had, the fact that my work had earned his respect was, uh, those things are great. I'm, I, I find uh, my confidence as an actor is the thing that makes me take a risk, and the more I take a risk, the more jobs I got, and that's, and you just can't be afraid to fail because you're gonna fail more, way more often than you succeed. Yeah. But it really, it really also, like, there were things that you learned on this show, yeah. Sackets, that you took into your next shows, like the, um, the family of actors that that director would bring around with him. And, and Sam Elliott was on that, right? Sam well, Elliott was on that. Sam was on it. Um, my audition, I had to. Um, we had, there were six actors on this audition. This is for one of the leads, one of the three main brothers in the show. Sam was going to play one of them. And uh, they said, well, wait till everybody gets here. Well, if you're going up for the lead in a, a, a show, you don't, you don't wait till everybody gets there. Yeah, you, you usually do it you, on you your own. You have your audition. But, <laughs> and the first thing they said and was, when we all got there, they said, okay, uh, walk over across this. It was a great big arena, dirt arena. And up in the stands, about three rows up, was a group of people. And as I got close, it's Glenn Ford and Ben Johnson and Sam <laughs> and Bob Totten. <laughs> and, uh, and all he said, Totten was running the show, he said, okay. Um, he had asked me if I could ride on the first audition I had before we had an audition at this ranch. And I said, well, not really. I mean, I, I've been to the pony rides where they'd strap you in and you bounce around the ring and I did a commercial, but I said, what I am is a good athlete and I can learn, and I was honest with him. So now he says to the six of us, okay, there's a bunch of horses back on the other side of the arena, Go over there, pick one out, put a saddle on it, yeah. and ride over here. <laughs> I'd, I'd never saddled a horse in my life. So I'm thinking all the way over, and, and uh, I look at a wrangler, and he's sizing me up, and I said, I don't know what I'm doing here, and he helped me. He said, this is a good one. Yeah. And bring that saddle over, do this, buckle that, do all that stuff, and uh, we rode back over. And that was a, a, a pretty weird audition. But the, the point was this, up in that stand, I couldn't get a smile out of Sam. I thought, you know, he's my pal, and I'll, I'll look at him, and I'll get a wink or something, nothing. <laughs> but the plain and simple fact is, Sam had that part, and he knew my work better than anybody. And if he didn't think I could play his brother in the movie, I wouldn't have been in it. So I, I, I really attribute it to Sam that I got the role, especially learning later that the director didn't want me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do say that you learned on this, that this was a genre that you, that you wanted to be a part of, and um, you ended up doing what, six other westerns, and, and then Jesse Stone. So it really informed your personal and yeah. your private, your personal and professional life. It it 
you know, sometimes you're wrong about what you think you want. And I thought, boy, it'd be neat if I, after boy, the packets, I, I wanted to have <laughs> horses and have a ranch. I missed that. <laughs> Probably best I did. Um, I mean. And <laughs> so, uh, you know, sometimes you're wrong. Well, I ended up in a ran with a ranch, and uh, I was right. And uh, it, it, it kind of changed my life. I, was, I did some really successful westerns. Mm -hmm. One of my favorites, Quigley Down Under, was uh, just, thanks. Uh, I, it, it just was a part of me. Um, I always felt I wanted a, a western in the works, in the mix. I'd like to do other stuff, comedies and things, but it was a big deal. Side note, I'd love to do a western with you. Can you anyway, ride? Anyway, okay. <laughs> Can I ride? No, but you didn't know how to ride. I learned. <laughs> I will too. Um, okay, so we got into the Jim Gardner, his advice. You, you said no to Magnum. Yeah. But then they convinced you. And well, they, they kind of weaseled their way into something, and then Don Belisario, I never, they said, well, you gotta meet with potential writers, because I, I said to them, Glenn Larson can't have anything to do <laughs> with the new Magnum. And basically, what I heard back from my lawyer was, oh, who the hell does he think he is? He's never been on the air. I had done six unsold, unsold pilots at that point. So <clears throat> anyway, Don Belisario, Belisario wrote a great script, but I had never, I'd never met with a writer. Um, and I had to have lunch with him, and I, I, I hadn't auditioned writers and all, but uh, Don made it real easy and said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do something like Rockford. Not a perfect James Bond-like guy which was the script I turned down. And uh, I want him to have flaws. That's the most interesting thing I find in any character. And he said, say no more. Mm -hmm. And about two weeks later, he was really fast. Um, I got to read the best two hour movie script I had ever been handed. Yep. And then and one thing, uh, this, it's a yeah. pet peeve. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry. A person. Um, so uh, Don calls me. The show um, was uh, picked up, but then the actors went on strike. Mm. But he tells me um, the studio um, wants to change the title to Magnum P.I. And I said, that's a horrible title. <laughs> That's terrible. Where did they get that idea? Well, it turned out that Glenn Larson's script, the character was named Harry Magnum, not Thomas Magnum. And, and Glenn was very good at ripping off other things and, <laughs> or being derivative. And uh, uh, basically, they were afraid they were going to get sued by Clint Eastwood because he did a movie, Magnum Force. So. But the problem is this. I, I had lived in Hawaii for quite a while while the actor strike was going on, and um, PI is a less than flattering term for a Philippine island. Mm. <laughs> mm. And I said, do they know that? Oh. It isn't, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's, it was slang, so I refuse. My record is, I think, spotless. I never call it Magnum PI. And if you want to change the way you call that show, I'd be very, very happy. There you, I think we all will. Magnum. We all will. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep moving forward because um, we could talk about Magnum all day. Um, you're, about to, you're about to film Magnum, and you get a call. Um, you have an audition. <laughs> you have an audition. They don't have a script. You don't have any sides, you have to go there and... Yeah, was it an audition for a show called uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Um, 
and they'd been looking at everybody in town. And uh, so I, I was kind of philosophic. I said, well, I'll go. It'd be neat to meet Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, but um, I think I'm the last guy I mean, guy how about in walking into seen. that room? Huh? How about walking into that room? Well, that, I didn't know what it was going to be like. Yeah. I expected a whole arena full of um, assistants and things. It was just the two of them, and it was an easy audition. We just talked. Yeah. And it was very cordial and everything else. And uh, I, I left, and I thought, well, I got to meet two giants, you know. That's, that's great. And forgot about it till I got home, and the phone was ringing, and said they want to test you for Raiders of the Lost Ark, do a screen test. So I said, well, uh, I got to, to Betty McCart, my dear friend and agent, who's in a, the show The Offer, by the way, because she worked on The Godfather and the uh, miniseries. Anyway, so I said, well, let me, uh, I want to read the script. She said they won't let anybody read the script. I said, well, can I have the change pages or the uh, uh, test scene pages. And they said, they won't give anybody any <laughs> test scene pages. Just go. And they said, you'll have plenty of time. So, And I go to Stephen's office, where I was supposed to report, and they're lighting the office corridor. So they didn't want anybody to know anything. <laughs> and uh, I, I tested. I tested with an actress by the name of Sean Young. Um, and um, I got home, and uh, I got a call from my agent, Betty, again. She said, they want to meet with you again. So I went back, I think, the next day, and I go in a room. It's Stephen and George, and they said, we want you to do Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, Congr Yeah, well, <laughs> no, <laughs> well... <laughs> It didn't quite work out, um, <laughs> as you know. Um, so Stephen says, uh, um, uh, here's the script. Go in my office and read it and let me know what you think. <laughs> so I, I got to about page eight of the script. And that's where the big boulders rolling down the hill after <laughs> Indiana and it was all on the page, everything. And I just went, oh, shit. This is really good. Um, it turned out they held the offer out for about six weeks. I told them I had uh, done a pilot called Magnum. Magnum I hadn't sold yet. And, uh, but they had first call. And they said, we're not worried about that. They want our movies. Um, you can probably do both. And it, it, in six weeks, it, got to the point, the more they wanted me, the more CBS decided uh, uh, we don't want a movie star in a series, he'll just leave. Now, I would never do that, but there's a whole lot of actors before me that had, so. And that was kind of the end of it. Um, well. But it was okay. It was I was pretty, Magnum wasn't like a consolation prize. It was a pretty good deal and the best thing that ever happened to me till Raiders came along, so. Yeah. People said, uh, don't go see it when it came to Hawaii. Yeah. I'm doing Magnum. They said, you'll get depressed. I said, no, I want to see it. Because well, I had kind of put it behind me. You ended up doing, um, what, 163 episodes of Magnum? 163. Yeah. And during that time, yeah, huge. You were able to still do other films. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was, I was interested in seeing, because there was a big movie that you did called High Road to China. Yeah. And by, directed by Brian G. Hutton. And you're the main guy. It's like you and Bess Armstrong, you are carrying this movie. Yeah. And you say, there were times that I couldn't believe I was here and I was just, I was still feeling like that kid from Sherman Oaks. Well, I think you know, the kid from Sherman Oaks never leaves you. Yeah. And basically, um, it was, the, the thing that was so amazing about it when I, I didn't get to do Raiders, in those days the business was really segregated, kind of snooty, I would call it. 
But uh, if you were a television actor, particularly a lead, you didn't do movies. They didn't watch you. Um, there was this strata that has since broken down quite a bit. <clears throat> but in those days, that was the case, so I said, well, I guess I'm going to be a TV actor, and that's not a big cross to bear. And uh, then I get offered this, this $20 million action-adventure film called High Road to China, which was ironically the budget of Raiders. <laughs> So now I'm, I'm in a big movie, yeah. and uh, the kid from Sherman Oaks was at the same, there was a lot, there were actors who had done a TV series, leads I'm really talking about, who'd done a lead in a series, and then had a successful film career, but nobody had really done it at the same time. And the business, that doesn't make me that special, it just means the business was changing. Well, I think you're kind of special. In fact, one of the special the things I really loved reading in your book was that you really took a lot of times throughout the book, right the night before you're filming Magnum, and multiple times where you're you're reflective about yourself and your family and your journey, and you always seem to have a deep level of gratitude for all of the opportunities. Um, is this something that like you just came, it was just, it came to you from a young age where you kind of taught this? Is this something that was ingrained from your childhood or? Well, there's nothing wrong with a little gratitude when you have, a, look, it was a frustrating long road. I was 35 when I got Magnum, so um, as I put it, I was laying bricks for a long time. Um, one by one, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I, you, you couldn't write a better story ultimately. I mean, I got Magnum and nobody knew really who I was, except maybe a guy on a Salem billboard smoking a menthol cigarette. <laughs> um, and that was a blessing. It was frustrating all the years that I studied and all, but to kind of burst on the scene as a leading man, a fully formed one in mm -hmm. Sam's terms, is a rare opportunity. And um, that was a blessing along with a whole lot of things along the way. If uh, that little ultimatum I gave Universal hadn't worked out, I never would have worked again. They would have seen to it that, uh, oh, he's difficult. Um, so, um, I think my dad said it, if not, he certainly lived it, but risk is the price you pay for opportunity. I've tried to always remind myself of that, and uh, that was worth the risk. Of course, it turned out okay, so. <laughs> it did turn out. And I, I feel like your dad gave you a really nice piece of advice when you were first starting out, because yeah. you didn't come from a family of, of actors. <clears throat> you you had this opportunity and... Yeah, I, I, my dad was managing the Coldwell Banker office in the San Fernando Valley and uh, um, I was at SC. I don't think I shared my, the fact that I wasn't gonna graduate that year. <laughs> but I, I, and I had a management training job with United Airlines. I was kind of their campus representative at SC and, and I said, Dad, this studio wants to sign me to a contract. And he really thought for a minute, he was really listening. And he finally just said, look, I think it's a lot like with your older brother, Bob, who had by that time signed a contract with the Dodgers um, as a pitcher. Um, Tommy Lasorda signed him. And, um, he said, it's one of those occupations that um, is kind of special and you don't want to get to be about 35 if, if you don't take advantage of it and wonder what if. Yeah. And that was really good advice. And, and he said, of course, you're gonna to have to call your boss at United. And I was kind of secretly hoping he would, but <laughs> it's not my dad, so. <laughs> um, and, 
he gave it, uh, uh, that advice just he was totally forthright, totally non-judgmental about it uh, other than it was very positive advice. And I said, gee, thanks, Dad. And, and as I walked out, I don't, I, I, he, he didn't say it for me to hear. Um, he just said it. Um, but I heard it. He said, uh, just don't let them change you. Um, I, it wasn't meant for me, mm. but I heard it. And uh, it, I realized how hard that advice to take this opportunity really was for him, because he'd heard all the horror stories about Hollywood and this and that and failed careers and everything else. But uh, uh, the advice was take the risk. You don't want to wonder what if. That's great. And it, it could not have been easy for him. I don't think it was easy, but you, wouldn't, you couldn't read him. No. I mean, he, he, he just was very forthright. It was only, I think, it was kind of anxious just as I was leaving, but, but to himself. But I heard it. <laughs> well, I have um, pages and pages of more questions. I know we're running out of time. How much time? Can we go over? What's the deal here? Are we going to be thrown out? No. What'd you say? I think we can keep going. OK. OK, well, I want to go back to a story that I read. So when I started out, one of my first movies, I was girl number three on the bench. OK, number three. But you were young stud number four. Yes, I was. Yes, you were. I think it was number four. It was number four. Yeah. And uh, you remember that job and who it was with? I do remember that, that job because uh, I worked with Miss West, as she was called, uh, Mae West. Is everyone and in here too young to know Mae West? So. <laughs> OK, he worked with her. I mean, yeah, come on. Yeah, in a movie. I know a lot of people don't know who she well, uh, was, but she had, she had this quality, very sexy, and she would, you always felt like you were getting away with something watching her. And she'd do these double entendres. And when, when I was young stud number four, she had all these young actors lined up, and she played this very, uh, um, uh, she loved men. Leti <laughs> Letitia, Van, I don't know. Anyway, but, but she had all these guys lined up for interviews. I was one of them. And uh, she, she comes through this hallway in a, in a, with a big hat. and Everything she wore was white. Everything was white. <laughs> she, and she passes through us, comes to the door, and she says, get your ready, uh, resumes ready, boys. <laughs> and... Uh, and she looks back and she sees young stud, I think he was number seven. And she says, how tall are you? And he says, six foot seven inches, ma'am. She says, well, never mind the six feet, let's talk about the seven inches. <laughs> well, she, she wrote her own stuff. Um, it wasn't a very good movie. <laughs> But, uh, and I, I made the mistake of wearing my own clothes and I had this heavy tweed double-breasted suit. And if you're on a hot set, you don't want to say, stop sweating, Tom, stop sweating, Tom, because you'll sweat more. And I was soaking wet and uh, I just remember all that. But I, what happened was um, she, she was very nice to me and she, uh, um, asked me to escort her to a couple things through one of her people. She was all business. But, um, you know, she liked a young man on her, her arm, you know, because it was, it was just plain good business. Um, <laughs> so I had uh, a dinner with her and her manager, and then I also uh, 
escorted her to an event at SC. A lot of stories about Miss West in there. Um, great stories, she great did, uh, stories about- Did I tell the other one? So I, I go to, I got a call back <laughs> at her apartment and I didn't know what to expect. And my agent secretary says, you have an interview at 8 p.m. <laughs> with Mae West in her apartment. <laughs> well, come on. But I, I thought the same thing. And um, <laughs> so I go into the apartment, and everything's white. The couch is white. The piano's white. She's dressed in white. And, uh, there is a big grand piano, and, and she said, I'd like you to read with me. This is before I got the part. And, uh, and I said, I tried to give my best experienced actor voice uh, to her and say, oh, oh certainly, okay. But she, uh, so I was scared to death, and her manager was there. So I read with her, and, and she wrote her own stuff, and I was so nervous Every time she'd say a line, see, when she, she wasn't Mae West when she just talked to you, but suddenly we read the scene and it's Mae West. <laughs> and uh, I just kept laughing, I, n <laughs> nervously. And I think she thought I thought it was really funny, and it was pretty funny, but it was nerves. So then she says, after the little read we did, she's, she goes over to the piano and she leans against it and she said, come here. <laughs> and she was still Mae West. So I went over and she said, put your, put your hands on my waist. <laughs> so I put my hands on her waist and she said, now spread your legs. <laughs> True. So I spread my legs, and suddenly she was Miss West again, and looked at her manager and said, it's going to work. Because <laughs> what it was, was she wanted to always appear to be very tall and statuesque, and she's only about five feet tall. So she wanted to see if I could become shorter. <laughs> so that was the reason to spread my legs. Shame on you for thinking anything <laughs> I love that story. I love it. And there's so many stories in this book like that. I mean, Carol Burnett, Frank Sinatra. My favorite image of you and Frank, and I think Larry Minetti, like smoking a cigarette in like a coat closet, just hanging out. Maybe it was Larry. Yeah, we had dinner. I got to know Frank really well, I'm happy to say. It was his last acting job. Yeah. So we're, we're at, uh, I, I think, a restaurant in Chicago. And Frank looks at Larry and I and he goes, and we go into a, a little cloakroom, a waiter's cloakroom, you know, closes the door and he lights us up a cigarette. Well, I didn't smoke, but how can you not smoke with Frank Sinatra? <laughs> so we're doing, we're talking and it was just a, it was just kind of lovely. It was like we were part of yeah. the guys with Frank. With Frank. And all of a sudden, uh, uh, I don't know whether it was Jilly, the guy who was always close to him, but somebody stuck their head in and said, Frank, she's looking for you. Because Barbara didn't want him to smoke. So Frank takes a cigarette <laughs> and throws it into the white cotton coat hanging up in the waiter's closet. <laughs> And he's gone back to the table. And it, it was just a, it's hard to explain. You had to be there, but it was <laughs> um, just sitting, hanging out, having a cigarette with Frank Sinatra was so kind of great. Cool. You know, when I, Larry told me, um, first told me, because he knew Frank better than I did, he said, Frank wants to do the show. And I said, Really? He says, But you got to call him because he wants to be asked. So I call him up and I don't know what to say or anything. And I, look, a television show, the scripts aren't all ready for the whole season. They, they just come as, as they're ready and uh, it's kind of organized chaos. So I said, Frank, if we do a show for you, we're gonna have to write it for you. He says, yeah, I know. 
and uh, I said, uh, what do you want to do? He said, oh, I don't care. Just make sure I get to beat somebody up. <laughs> so it was uh, pretty. And then he says, I won't charge you anything. I said, thank you. Universal will be here. <laughs> really happy. Just pay my expenses. And Universal was just elated until they got the bill. <laughs> His expenses were about $250,000. Anyway. Um, well, I could keep going to more of these questions, but I think we're running out of time. Yeah, and should we do some of these questions? Yes, okay, we'll take a few from the audience. Um, what, was, what has playing Commissioner Frank Reagan taught you about the challenges, challenges for, uh, faced by modern leaders? Modern what? Leaders. Well, um, it taught me a lot, and I, I, I did a movie um, that I'm very proud of called I Count on the D-Day, where they asked me to play General Eisenhower. And I said to my agent, Betty, I said, what are they thinking? <laughs> I just never thought I'd be asked to do that. But I, I did it, and I did it in a way I'm very proud of. But that was all about, that was all about it was a story leading up to D-Day and the, the pressure on the command staff planning D-Day and the consequences and the fact that they were expecting 60 or 70 percent losses. And uh, I just learned a lot about the weight of command, which is a very hard thing as an actor to communicate. Because an actor, uh, if you're playing General Eisenhower and you're in front of the, your people, you don't show weakness. So how am I going to show the worry and the anxiety and all? And, and I found ways. And I kept looking for private moments where nobody was looking. At, and uh, it worked out well. And that schooled me very well to play Frank Reagan, who's got, he's a man who's got 35,000 cops uh, whose lives are at risk every day. He's, he's lost a son, and the way Frank has this hyperactive sense of responsibility, and, and, and on his bad days, he's going, I basically gave the order that got my son killed. Well, he didn't give the order, and it was down through the chain of command, but it was, uh, it was a, a so the, the challenge has always been in Blue Bloods when he's at the office is to somehow communicate to the audience the weight of that responsibility and still play a man who's got a game face. Because if you're a leader like the police commissioner or General Eisenhower, you got a game face on almost always. Well, I'm feeling the game face from all the people that are <laughs> trying to wrangle us up. Um, we all appreciate you sharing the book and your time with us tonight. So, Tom Selleck. Oh.